Well, I'm seeing a lot of familiar faces and I just want to say thank you so much for joining me today. This means so much to me and I'm so happy that you can be here with me. Thank you. Welcome to um, the Boswell Virtual Event Series. Um, it is day 4,207 of us being in business. Anna is the author of Storied and Scandalous Wisconsin, History of Mischief, Menace, Heroes, and Heartbreak. She's in conversation with Molly Snyder, who is the author of Walking Milwaukee. Um, Walking Milwaukee, yes. Storied and <laughs> Scandalous Wisconsin, signed copies at Boswell, Walking Milwaukee, possibly signed copies if Molly comes over to sign them. <laughs> so, but otherwise, both are for sale. We're thrilled to have two of the best-selling uh, books about regional Milwaukee and Wisconsin this year together on one stage. I give you um, our author and conversation partner. Thank you very much for coming. Hi everyone. I'm so excited that you're here. I'd like to introduce you to my friend Molly. Molly is everyone in Milwaukee's friend. She's well known as a 20 year veteran at On Milwaukee and we became more closely acquainted when I joined the uh, sisterhood of former Fister narrators and she's agreed to uh, have a conversation with me about some of the more scandalous Milwaukee stories that are included in the book. Thanks, Anna. I I can't wait. I love a good scandal. So I mean, these are these are wonderful. And and all the uh, as much as I know Milwaukee, uh, these many of these were new to me. So thank you for introducing me to some really great and scandalous people. So, <laughs> we're all Milwaukeeans, right? We're all Milwaukeeans. So we just some of us, so, you know are uh, a little more, again, I'm gonna use the word mm -hmm. scandalous than others, but thank you. So were there any scandalous um, people that you really caught your eye? Wow, well, uh, I, I mean, they all, they all kind of did, um, but I was particularly taken um, with uh, Prince Roberts, Arthur Prince Roberts, yeah. I believe is his name because um, I'm very interested in psychic abilities and occult and things like that. And I feel like it's a fine line. Like I believe really what you, what, what he believes is that, you know, what he believes is that it was rare, but it happens. It can happen. And, or people, you know, whether or not people are born that way or they develop that skill, uh, I don't know, but you know, or it's both. But so I found it really interesting um, that someone was able to, you know, truly predict the number of bombings that mm -hmm. he predicted. Um, and then, you know, on top of that, to predict the exact day of his own death. Now, well, that's one of the, things where well, the big question, would you want to be able to, you know, do that? But it blew me away. Well, let me tell everyone who hasn't had the opportunity to read about it a, a little bit about what Molly's talking about. So it is the story, and if you've been on um, my classic tour, I talk a little bit about uh, Doc Roberts and, and that he is in the famously infamous chapter, that first chapter. He was a, a psychic detective. People called him the American Sherlock Holmes because he would reveal something unnerving about you when he first meets you. Um, Sherlock Holmes did it with lame observation, but as we know, Doc Roberts did it with psychic powers. And he's really famous throughout the arc of his life. He is most famous for predicting the that there was going to be a series of bombings in the 1930s in Milwaukee. And I love telling that story because a lot of people don't realize that we had a series of bombings, but that, that might've been his most showy thing, but he actually um, also was able to lead uh, police to a body uh, several times. He was able to direct them to uh, a, a murderer who had uh, fled to Canada so he has a lot of these great things and some people still to this day use him as an example that psychic phenomena is um, real. I found all of that very fascinating, but when I was doing more research on him, I found that um, he was also a bit of a charlatan as well. And I found that really fascinating, um, especially 
I guess it, it would have been hard to be in love with Doc Roberts because Doc Roberts was a quite a bit of a cad. And he was in court for quite some time because women who he was wooing and promised to marry were suing him because he was taking advantage of them. Um, he also had a pretty lengthy police record, not just of helping the police with crimes, but uh, foiling uh, or, or rather trying to pull the wool over people's eyes when he was um, getting hired for psychic services. So he's a really mixed bag. And that's the kind of person that I think is really fun to research because it, it, when someone's complicated, it makes it more interesting, at least for me. Well, and so many of the characters in your book are mixed bags. And that was the thing uh, that that goes for, uh, you know, Sherman Miller Booth, too, who is uh, in your book. And the fact that he was known as both an abolitionist and then a rapist is like the perfect example of like, yay, oh. Yeah. Right. Um, well, and you know, we... People do not realize that, um, you know, we really revere him in Milwaukee. It's what Booth Street's named after. Well, and actually, I lived on the corner of Glover and Booth. There is this one. Street, really? There is a one, one little tiny part um, of Reservoir, which is in uh, River West slash Arambe mm -hmm. neighborhood. One little part. And it is was renamed while I was living there in 1995. It was renamed Glover. And it's like six houses. But it's called so Glover meets Booth. And that was the whole idea. And so I had actually always heard that Booth was this abolitionist and, you know, thought he was this great guy. And that's why they intersected those two streets. And I thought that was really meaningful. And I even went to, uh, you know, a number of celebrations on the block for it. And then I read your book and I'm like where was Anna in 1995 we should have at least known you know that known the whole story I'm not saying that you know we shouldn't have named well no I'm saying we shouldn't have named the street after him probably I would have to agree with you and so yeah. would people who were his contemporaries uh the story that we're talking about again comes from famously infamous and some of you may have heard me tell this story I sometimes tell it uh in the Yankee Hill tour because it comes up, um, as you probably know, because you're Milwaukeeans, that Cathedral Square used to be where our courthouse and jail was. And that was the place where um, runaway slave Joshua Glover was taken and held because of the, the, the Runaway Slave Act, which said even though he fled from the South and came to a free territory, he still belonged to someone else and he was jailed. Well, Booth was really instrumental in gathering over 5,000 people and they ringed that building and they broke this, this Joshua Glover out of jail and helped him flee to Canada. And this is such a, a integral part of our history that it's that mural that's under the underpass um, of 43, it's kind of by the Pfizer Forum. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Just go along with it, it's a real place. It, that's what, what it's depicting. So we love him then. And he becomes a, a, a darling of the state because he gets arrested for helping this. He takes it to the Supreme Court. He is so incredibly popular and well-regarded. And then he, um, is he rapes his babysitter. So what happened is his wife is going out of town for the weekend and he has kids at home. And this girl is only 14 and she's one of their neighbors. Not only their neighbors, but they go to church together. And the mom said, hey, can you have Carolyn and her sister sleep over and take care of my girls? And um, that is exactly what happens. And she is such a, a little girl and so innocent. She doesn't even really know what's happening at first. And she ends up, they, they find out that this happened and Booth approaches her dad and says, hey, I have really wronged you. You know, can I make it up to you with some cash? And to her dad's credit, he is like, are you kidding me? No. And, and Booth's like, well, you know, if you take it to court, it's not gonna be good. And he's like, I don't care, and brings it to court. And this is Milwaukee scandal. When I was reading the actual transcripts, 
which are at Milwaukee County Historical Society, just throwing out to them because they have been amazing as far as research partners. Um, it, it's this tissue fine paper that I had to, they even gave me a, a better magnifying glass so I could do it because I'm 87 years old. But I'm reading through this and there are things that we would not see in the newspaper now because uh, there was um, a whole entire day of hymen discussion because apparently she must have had a very elastic hymen and they- Or you know, you they, had a really small pee pee. Right. Well, there, but they were actually publishing this in the paper. Try, it was actually really sexually informative for the whole city. Like you don't necessarily bleed the first time you have, it was, this is actually in our newspaper. So it was fascinating to read. At the end of the day, no one wins because the jury, it's inconclusive. But Mrs. Booth is appalled. She takes all of his children, divorces him. No one returns his calls anymore. He is persona non grata in Milwaukee. He ends up moving to Illinois, which is kind of, you know, where bad things go. And it starts a whole new life. And he kind of came back into my life because I was taking, um, a tour of Forest Home Cemetery because they have some really great tours if you like this kind of thing. And they have them um, broken up in all, all, all different genres. I've gone to a woman's thing. I've gone to entrepreneurs. They, they're just such a fountain of information there and they're so passionate about it. So I'm walking through and we are looking at other things and I noticed Booth's lone headstone buried with no one else. And I thought that is fitting, you disgusting pig. Absolutely. So, sorry to bring me down, everyone, but it's <laughs> interesting story in the famously well, infamous. <laughs> I've been to uh, Forest Home Cemetery probably a hundred times, and I've never noticed his his grave. So that's on my list now is to mm -hmm. go find his grave, and then I'm going to spit on it. So that's going to be like okay. maybe, maybe I'll wait till after all this stuff. Corona. So yeah, Mo yeah. <laughs> Molly will be in the next next version of. Famously infamous <laughs> post money. I'm right. I'm already. So let's like get on it, Anna. Let's be your second book. Contemporary uh, scandalous. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, you brought up the um, historic society and I was just curious, like, where do you do most of your research? Where did you get, find all of these stories? Where well, they, they came to me in all different ways. So uh, I, I hope that this won't be boring. I'm going to tell you actually how this book came about, because you're probably wondering, why did the ghost lady write this book? Well, I ended up pitching a ghost book to this publisher, and they're like, man, we don't really want to do that book, but we want to work with you. We have this um, series that we're launching. Do you want to write the one for Wisconsin? And I said, yes, because... A lot of times I get pigeonholed as just ghosts and because that's what I'm mostly known for and I understand that, but I thought that this would give me an opportunity to show people that I'm more uh, than just ghosts. And so I didn't have a predetermined, like this hasn't been a passion of mine that I've been collecting scandalous stories for my whole life. It was, I signed this contract because I want to do something new and then I just dove in. So some of the things I already knew I wanted to do because um, they were things that I've just always been attracted to and I explored them on my radio show when I was on River West Radio, Haunted Heartland. Like Haunted Heartland, I talked about Taliesin, which is in the book, and, and some other things because I'm just so super drawn to it. But then other things found me. Like for example, the um, when you go into the the chapter about the love story has gone bad. The, the interesting story about the police chief who was in a love triangle with his wife and an office worker there, and it ended up in um, the lover's murder done with the police chief's gun. I mean, this is a great story, right? I didn't know anything about this. I just kept on seeing, um, because a lot of what I do is actually just read old newspapers. Mm -hmm. So I am looking, I was looking for another story. I was looking for that mafia murder um, that happened in Kenosha. And this was happening at the same time. So I kept on seeing it uh, as I was trying to scan through the 
if you remember it a hundred years ago when you were using microfilm, yes. this guy is doing. And so you see, you know, you like kind of like swoop through and you see all these different stories. And so I kept on seeing this and I'm like, this story is hot. I want to know everything about it. Um, it was also super heartbreaking once you re really get into what this relationship was like. Mm -hmm. I just wish that um, I could have had the opportunity to talk to, to this wife, but yeah. she, you know, she, well, I don't want to spoil it for you, but she dies. I was, <laughs> when I was flipping through the book before I started reading it, that was the first headline that jumped out at me. And it said, uh, two women and a gun. Yeah. And I was like, that I'm like, this is not going to be good. And I have to read this immediately. So <laughs> I actually read that one first before I read the book all the way through, but it's just, it is. And it's more of a little bit, a little bit longer story that you tell in the book, isn't it? Or like, I, well, right. So, you, I, you know, I kind of was learning how to do this as I was doing the book. Mm -hmm. And so I can tell when, like what arc I, cause I didn't write it in order, but when I'm looking at the stories, I know where I wrote it in the progression because I could see and feel myself becoming stronger mm -hmm. as a, a writer and a researcher as I was doing it. Mm -hmm. So now um, uh, many, well, if you know me, you probably know I am finishing up my third book right now. And so I can even tell that there's such a difference between from this book to the the stuff that I'm doing right now. So it, it's, it's kind of exciting to watch yourself grow. It, you don't have to just do it when you're a young person, you can be, you know, well into middle age and still be growing and getting new skills. I love that. I totally love that. I have been thinking a lot about that lately. Like I love all those lists that are like, you know, 30 people under 30 or whatever. But now I want to see 50 people over 50 that are just like mm -hmm. rocking it, you know, like, or 40 people over 40, you know, because mm -hmm. I think that, you know, your story, Anna, which I've always been very drawn to since the very beginning uh, is really, you know, how we became friends, I think, and, and, and why I think you're such an incredible person is because you were an English teacher, a high school English teacher, and you were very, very good at it. You had a very solid could have retired a certain number of years, you know, whole thing. And, you know, with the support of your husband, your wonderful husband, of course, you took this huge leap and you started Gothic Milwaukee and doing the tours and now all the books and you are really walking the walk and you are, and you're open with us and saying like, I don't really always know what I'm doing. I am just moving. I'm trying to learn new things. You know, I am trying to, uh, this isn't the topics that I thought that I was going to write about, but this was presented to me and it was close enough. I took it. And I think, you know, that alone, aside from the stories, like your story is so inspiring that you could almost be like uh, inspirational speaker slash ghost lady. <laughs> <laughs> but no? always the ghost, because, you know, if I'm being 100% honest, the ghosts are what bring all the bills to be paid. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> everything, but I, I love um, the opportunity to just try new things and explore new things. Um, but I did actually miss the ghost because when, when I was writing this book, I would maybe even out of habit, find the supernatural thing and kind of draw it in and they'd be like, no, no, this is not a ghost book. But when I was negotiating the book that I am working on now for the same publisher, I said, I, I really do want to add um, the supernatural component into it because I think that that makes a really great um a great legend story when you have that element mm -hmm. and they said go for it so what i'm working on now is shipwrecks but as you know that they're you know fraught with um you know supernatural things because uh as we know there's a chapter about shipwrecks in this book um maritime disasters is something i really love which is, I know, very strange, but for some reason, I just find it so fascinating because you're already in peril when you're on water. And then everything that happens after that just adds to it. So we have some great, great uh, stories in the book. Some of them you've heard me tell before, the story of the Rouse Sim and I, no, it's not in that song. Um, the, but the Phoenix, a lot of you have heard me tell the story of the Phoenix. And that is in this book. It is a, a terrible tragedy 
that has a supernatural component that they made me take out, but you've heard me tell it. Um, just as a quick reminder, the Phoenix was a ship that caught on fire as it was bringing all kinds of immigrants into the area and they were so close to their homes, they could actually see the lights from the town that they were going to go to, but their ship became engulfed in flames and hundreds of people died. It's a really terrible tragedy. It's happening right off the shore of Sheboygan and the supernatural component of that is that there are lots and lots of ghostly sightings in that park where bodies were starting to wash up. They, people are experiencing cold spots and the adjoining um, yacht club apparently has a lot of spiritual activity as well. Now it could be because these people are, were longing for land so passionately that once their bodies got there, their spirits stayed. But it also could be because a lot of bodies that washed up on that beach became looted. And, um, you know, maybe they had all of their possessions, everything that they, they owned because they, they were moving from their old country to their new country. And maybe they're sticking around to try to get those things back. I don't know. Interesting. But just as a, a tiny fun fact, that chapter is how I got the contract for the, the third book. Nice. Because I wrote all these maritime disasters and they said, we're doing a series of this. Do you want to write it? And I said, sure. Can it have ghosts? And they said, why not? <laughs> can you have a maritime disaster without a ghost anyway? I don't, I don't think you can. So, well, no. not, not for me, but there are some great maritime disasters in here for those of you who don't particularly need ghosts. There is murder and there is intrigue as well. So when a murder happens on a boat, it becomes very mysterious. Is there romance? Uh, in, yeah, sure. I mean, none of it's good. <laughs> It, oh, bad. There's bad romance. Okay. There's bad romance. Bad romance. Uh, okay. A lot of a lot of you Milwaukeeans are huge fans of Miss Kitty, famous madam. She's in the book. I see that there is a question: Is Dirty Helen in the book? She's not, but she would have been a great inclusion. But someone wrote a whole entire book about her, so she probably doesn't need more press. Yeah, I appreciated particularly reading a lot about uh, the women in, in the book. So we should, uh, I'd love to hear, you know, anything more um, that you might know about Sally. And Sally is an interesting character to me because I've lived in Milwaukee long enough and I'm old enough that I remember Sally's and mm -hmm. it, which was a inside the Knickerbocker Hotel. Sally was connected to the mafia. Um, Anyway, I just, I thought that was a really uh, interesting and I wanted to know, as, you know, I, I'll probably look up more about her just because she's someone that was like, you know, in my lifetime, um, I never knew how she died. And I think considering that can, relationship that she had with her daughter and then which led to her death, I just think the whole thing is really fascinating. So if you wanted to elaborate on that a little bit, uh, I thought she was just a, a fascinating female character, really. I agree. And but when I was researching her, I felt a lot more sympathy for her than I had before because it seemed like she really had a very difficult life and I, she did some very questionable things. I'm not saying that she didn't, but uh, I can see that uh, she had plenty of times where her back was against the wall and she did the best that she could to keep on going. And so um, I, I fell in, in like with her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. during this. And also it was interesting how um, it, it made me, it, particularly researching her, made me miss or, or realize how much we miss um, with local media because she had a clear relationship with some of the um, newspaper staff that was interviewing her, which is how they got that level of intimacy um, to discuss her complicated relationship with her daughter, and even for that journalist to speculate that it was not a mere car accident that caused her. It was probably 
some kind of a domestic dispute in the car that caused that. And he would not have been able to make that speculation had he not had that long-term connection with this woman. And that's because we had this robust team of local journalists mm -hmm. who were there to make these connections. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, and just to back it up for anyone who doesn't know, I mean, she was, I don't know, how would you describe her, Anna? Like she, she was, wasn't a part of the mafia, but she was married into it or? Well, could she be um, the mafia's favorite hostess? There you go. Okay. I can wrap my mind around that. <laughs> well, you know, she certainly had a complicated relationship and maybe uh, tried to exercise more power than some people thought that she had. Okay. And, and, and that kind of comes up in the stories. I was, um, if the accounts that I've read and that I've written about are correct, she was a very gutsy woman because that whole, um, there's a, a little part of the story where she is uh, unhappy with the way a business deal went between another restaurateur and that person's restaurant ends up catching on fire. <laughs> and then how she lets that man know that, yeah, I'm the one who burned your dream to the ground. Just felt bold and sassy and uh, like nothing that I've ever experienced. Like someone would have, it would be very difficult to write a book about her because who would you, where would you get this information? Most right. of the key players are dead. None of this stuff is documented. Right. Uh, but what we do know about her she she does not fail to entertain even in death. <laughs> and you know, as a entertainment writer for on Milwaukee, I have reported on hundreds and hundreds of restaurants that have closed over the last twenty years and opened, of course. But we're talking about closings. And when I got that little tidbit from your book about that Sally's closed mid meal, like it was like the craziest thing I've ever heard. I'm trying to imagine even as a person in the restaurant where, you know, you got your bread, you got your wine, you got your salad. And then all of a sudden, you know, you're kicked out because the restaurant has closed. You are not getting your spaghetti. You are, you, you don't even, you don't have to pay the bill, but you also got to get out now. And uh, I just, I thought that was just, that to me was almost like, I want to see that like in a, in a play or in a movie as a, as a scene, because it was so unique. Um, I almost feel like if you were there, you were there for that as well. Not just the food, but like everything that was happening. If something crazy happens, great. Because now you have yet another Sally story. Because it seemed that that restaurant attracted all kinds of people that you might want to talk about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. All those restaurants. And um, I'm Italian American. Um, and uh, my mother would always point out the everything that was Italian owned on the east side. I grew up on the east side. And so I remember Savoy, uh, Snugs, all of these places, you know, all very close together on the lower east side. Um, I didn't, I didn't go to them. We didn't really go to fancy restaurants ever, but I mean, I wish that I would have, but I, I remember them. And uh, it was, you know, it was, I, I love that you referenced Brady Street. I love uh, because it still does have a really strong Italian American presence to it. Um, it's just, yeah, I loved, I loved all the Italian American stuff. I was, I was blown away, uh, by the tidbit that you shared about the number of Italian owned bars there were in the third yeah. ward. Yeah. I didn't I can't remember the number, Anna, but it was like, I can't imagine that many bars in the third ward period. Cause it's so tiny, mm -hmm. but what, how many were there in the, just in the third ward, ward alone? Like I don't plenty. Know. I'm not, I don't remember either, but uh, what she's referencing is, so I tried to put some context into some of the chapters to help you understand. I talk about the mafia um, in Milwaukee and Madison, and I, and I put some context to that. And I think maybe it's my inner teacher that I just didn't want to give you stories. I was explaining, well, here, here is the world in which these stories happened. So I did that a few times. Um, I did that when I was talking about uh, vice. So how did we get laws on prohibition and how did that kind of come about? And I did not realize that since we have such giant drinking culture here, that we were once going to be a totally dry state and most people wanted it. How times have changed, right? right. <laughs> I barely even have a dry day during quarantine. So I can't even imagine... <laughs> 
what that would be like. You all know it. You're like that too. <laughs> We're all doing it. So, um, I, so I did, did add context into a bunch of the chapters so that you could kind of know um, how things started. And, and I learned a ton of stuff and I hope that you learn enough to be like, oh, interesting, but not so much that you're like, ma'am, this is not a textbook. I, so I, um, you know, learned about Indian gaming, something that I did not, did not know anything about because I'm extremely Midwestern and the idea of giving you money for anything that I, that isn't an exchange, I cannot do. So gaming is, is totally beyond me. And I learned a lot about it and we have, uh, some very stringent laws about it. We did not even allow sweepstakes, did not know that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and now, you know, Wisconsin very quickly became all about gaming and extraordinarily, uh, extraordinarily popular, of course, and just something, I hear you though, it's um, something that, you know, you, I, I, the times I've walked in there, I've lost 40 bucks at the blink of an eye and it's time for me to go to the bar or go home, but like, I can't. I've known people that have won big and I'm... I, you know, it's, it's a really interesting culture that I'm glad you, you, you brushed upon that. Great. Well, I don't want to be too boring and I'm <laughs> wondering if, if good people have any questions, which I'm totally, it will answer anything, even if it's a ghost thing, anything. I don't really know how to get you to ask me questions, but I just did that. One. Who was your favorite person in the book? Well, do you, do you remember the story about the newlyweds who were in a homemade boat? Mm -hmm. I have a suck. I am a sucker for a lady who falls in love with the wrong man. <laughs> and there is a lot of them in this book. And that's probably because I'm the one who picked out all these stories. So I was just, you know, going through stories after stories. I did a, um, I subscribe to a, a database of historic newspapers. And so I would sometimes like pick a like 1880s murder and then like see what come, like see what stories come up and just, you know, kind of like start reading through these newspapers and see if I find anything that resonates with me. So a, a lot of them that resonated with me are these ladies who just want some love fall in love with the wrong man. And this woman was a really, you know, prominent woman. And she was married, she ends up marrying a, a man who's really well known in counterculture in Chicago. And he decides that he is going to build a boat himself and take his bride on a honeymoon to Door County. And they end up staying with um, Sherwood Anderson, which I thought was totally interesting because I taught one of his books when I was an English teacher. And on the way back, the boat sinks. And he is left alive and she is left dead. And in a, when her body washes up, it does not really match the story that he said. And so I you know, would hate for her to have been having this final moments of her honeymoon and then have her discover something totally horrible about this man that she thought she loved. Yeah. yeah. And her, uh, she has a library devoted to her in Illinois, like a, a room in the library. And they let me use her image. And I'm so glad because that made me fall in love with her even more because she just looks like a, like a butter would not melt in my mouth type of lady, but not sanctimonious about it. So she looks like she'd be a lovely person. I've never heard that expression before. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Oh, someone asked me, what's the most chilling ghost story I know? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a great question. And it totally depends on my mood because it, Sometimes I can just get right to a, a scary story. I think probably the, the stories that, that resonate with me are the, the stories of someone being tricked by someone that they really love. Because I can't imagine anything more horrifying than that, than you being so vulnerable. So 
parents who end up killing their children, um, that kind of thing just, just hurts my entire soul. So those are the stories that really do it for me. Oh, someone asked, what's the next book I want to write uh, about after shipwrecks? I do not know. I am not sure. I'm working on some projects right now. So my brain is just, and I think after that is all done, and if nothing presents itself, then I'll have that chance to really think about what I want to do. But it seems like at least in the last five years, projects have been finding me rather than me finding projects. So maybe something out there really needs attention and it's waiting to find me. Awesome. And the most uniquely Wisconsin crime. Ooh, you know what? Okay, so this asks about a cheese curd smuggling thing. And there was a story that I was going to write about, but it was so complicated that I just couldn't do it in this short type of format. But I discovered that Al Capone was involved in this whole cheese smuggling scandal in Fond du Lac. And it had all of these technical layers for um, diverting milk and stuff. It was totally fascinating, but just it, I don't have the talent to distill something that complicated into something so small. But that was definitely the most Wisconsin thing that we have a, a Chicago gangster coming up north to do a cheese smuggler. <laughs> Perfect. It really is. Um, oh, debunk any urban legends. Yeah, you know, a lot of times when I start doing that, then I stop writing or I stop doing that because people get extremely disappointed when you do not give them what they want. And I'm really a, a lot about making people happy. So when I see something is totally going differently than people think it's going to, I'll stop writing it because people get genuinely mad about stuff and I'm not here to make people genuinely mad. What do you think about Haunchyville? Do you know what Haunt, you, oh, have you ever done any uh, research on that? Yeah, it's in here. No, oh. no, it's, it's in the first book. I'm sorry. Oh, Haunchyville okay. is in um, Milwaukee Ghosts and Legends. And I actually even write about how it, because that area has become so developed, it's really hard to, to believe that story still. And for those of you who don't know, there is this legend of Haunchyville, which is in uh, a rural area in Waukesha County that supposedly has um, circus people, all tiny people who have a village of tiny people. And if, if a average sized person comes across them, they may be killed. So teenagers late at night would like to drive out to Haunchville trying to find this, this um, missing society of people. And that area has become more and more developed. So it's, it's hard, you know, to keep that legend alive. But I love folklorists because now people say, and I don't know if you know this, Molly, that Grant Park, is where people have relocated from Haunchyville. Did not so ever do that. Not only do you have to watch out for those ghosts in Grant Park, but also the haunch relocated haunches. Well, that smells like an on Milwaukee story if I've ever heard one, because I don't, Ooh, think, do I don't it. think people knew that. Oh, I was saying, <laughs> anyway, I just got to write all the fluff, Anna, about the restaurants closing, remember? So you're, right. <laughs> you're, the, you're the historian, so, right. But I'm not. I'm not a historian. I want to make that really clear. I am an infotainer. I do not have a PhD in history. Um, I'm just a lady with a library card and some free time. <laughs> oh, I'm just a lady with a library card. That is something too. I don't know what yet, but that's like going to be your hit single when you get into singing or something. I don't know. And it's like your next career. I don't know, but it's a spoken word piece. It's something that's, well, you are, you are, you're more than that, but you are that. So. <laughs> are there any other questions that anyone has? If, if not, I just want to say that it, it genuinely means a lot to me that you are here with me tonight. 
I am so truly grateful for everyone that I have met through the tours, through the fist or through all the, the cool, weird things that I do that you've been around with me and it makes my life so happy and I'm so genuinely appreciative. So thank you for cheering me on. I really am grateful. And Molly, thank you for lending yourself tonight. Thank you for Can inviting me. people still book tours? Someone asked. Yeah. Little Ann was poor. Please <laughs> take a tour. <laughs> you can find more about that at gothicmilwaukee.com. Just as a fun fact, all of our outdoor tours are, are masked. You must wear a mask that covers your face and your nose or your mouth and your nose. And we're doing uh, much smaller groups than the 20 that we've done in the past, just to try to keep it safe. That's cool. Okay. Well, th thank you guys so much. Please come and visit Daniel. Get some books. Thank you very much to Anna Lord and, I and uh, Molly Snyder. Um, so glad that you were able to come. And thanks all of you for coming as well, because we wouldn't have um, a virtual bookstore one that's open two to four for browsing one to five a week. Um, limit of 10 people, there are lines marked outside the store, no food or beverages, no pets, blah, 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 blah. Um, but we're letting people in. <laughs> <That's not> <laughs> anyway, um, thank you all. Um, have thank a wonderful you. evening. And um, uh, may, may you uh, not be in the center of, uh, of any scandals, but maybe you get to look at them seriously from the sidelines, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Good night, everyone. Good night, guys. Thank you, Molly.